Dr. Diana Glyer is a professor of literature, literature at Azusa Pacific University and a member of Glen Kirk Church. She is an expert in C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien and has actually written a book on their relationship along with, with the relationship they had with the other Inklings uh, called The Company They Keep. We have a few copies outside afterwards and it's on Amazon as well. Uh, but it's a brilliant book. I remember the first time I sat down with Dr. Glyer uh, preparing, you know, what I thought were thoughtful questions about Lewis and Tolkien. Uh, and when I realized the expanse of her studies uh, and her, her knowledge, I realized that my question about whether dwarves were cooler than elves was probably not all that astute. So, <laughs> so I kept that to myself. But she, she has written a brilliant book uh, and, and has profound things to say about Tolkien. So please welcome Dr. Glyer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if you've been around Glen Kirk for any amount of time at all, then you know that our pastor, Jim Miller, is a self-proclaimed Tolkien nerd. Now, I got interested in this, and I decided I wanted to figure out what exactly a Tolkien nerd was. So I decided to consult the highest scholarly authority I could think of, my Facebook newsfeed. And... Uh, <laughs> According to that authority, you might be a Tolkien nerd if you named your daughter Arwen and your cat Glorfindel. <laughs> you might be a Tolkien nerd if you are still mad at Peter Jackson about leaving out Tom Bombadil. <laughs> or if you have a map of Middle Earth on your wall and it is covered with pencil corrections. You might be a Tolkien nerd if, when you lose your car keys, you go pawing through the house asking, where is it, my precious? <laughs> if you regularly enjoy second breakfast and your truck is named Shadow Facts, you might be a Tolkien nerd. But the surest sign of a Tolkien nerd is when you see a spider in your house and you whip out your elven blade and you scream, die, you spawn of Shelob. <laughs> Some of you sound like you might be Tolkien nerds too. <laughs> when I think of Tolkien nerds, I think of those of us who have been reading Tolkien for decades and who love the stories that he has to tell and the world that he created. And if you've been noticing your Facebook feed and reading some of the early reports of the new Hobbit movie, you may have noticed that there's a little bit of tension between the Tolkien nerds and, and Peter Jackson. And you may have wondered what some of that is all about. Well, some of the Tolkien nerds are a little perturbed because Jackson has made some changes in the story. There are some factual shifts, and that is a change, and it does bother some people. I don't know that that's the key of it, the heart of it for me. For me, it seems that Peter Jackson has missed what Tolkien is really talking about. It seems that for Peter Jackson and for J.R.R. Tolkien, there's a difference in proportion. Let me try to explain it this way. In the films, they're, well, they're action-adventure films. There's a crescendo toward war and villains and sword fights and arrow battles and very bad teeth. <laughs> <laughs> There's flying arrows, dwarves racing through barrel uh, races and very loud music and hairbreadth escapes. Now, it's not that Tolkien doesn't understand danger and tension and drama. Those things play a big part in his books. But as I said, the proportions are different for Tolkien. For Tolkien, the emphasis is on the goodness of home, the warmth of family, the beauty of friendship, and the value of sacrifice. Now, some of you may remember Tolkien's description of Rivendell, which is the home of Elrond. And here's how Tolkien describes that house. He says, his house was perfect. Whether you like food or sleep or work 
or storytelling or singing or just sitting and thinking best or if you like a pleasant mixture of them all, evil things did not come into that valley. It is a place where travelers find their clothes are mended and so are their bruises, their tempers, and their hopes. That's a beautiful description of Elrond's house and a wonderful mission statement for those of us who are part of the church. In short, for Tolkien, what is dear and precious and important is the Shire. There are struggles and challenges and there is evil and it is real. But the emphasis is on those things that are small and homey. The fabric of everyday life is the emphasis for him. Now, there's no better way to illustrate this than to share with you a very great secret. It's a secret that any Tolkien nerd could tell you. Now, maybe you've bought a copy of The Lord of the Rings somewhere, and I'm here to tell you that there's a part that's missing in your copy of The Lord of the Rings. You see, when Tolkien wrote that story, he wrote an extra chapter. And when it came time to submit his manuscript to the publisher, he left that chapter out. It comes at the very, very end of the story. The story as it now exists ends with Sam arriving back at the Shire, right? And saying, well, I'm back. The next chapter that was supposed to come right after that takes place some years later. Sam has married his sweetheart, Rosie Cotton, and they have 13 children. <laughs> Their children's names are Eleanor, Primrose, and Daisy, and several of them are named after some of Sam's companions, little Frodo, and little Mary, and Pippin, and there's Ruby, and Robin, and little Tom. In the real last chapter of Lord of the Rings, Sam is sitting by the fire in his home, in the Shire, and he's telling his children bedtime stories, stories of Middle Earth, stories of his own adventures. The children love these stories, and they love the parts best where their papa has a part to play. Tell me about the, the spider again, one of the little children says. And another says, I want to meet the elves, Dad, just like you did. All of the evidence is clear. For Tolkien, the story ends in the Shire, around the fire, in homes, in stories, among family and friends. In the story, when story time is over, the children are tucked into bed and Sam and his wife, Rosie, Step out to look at the night sky. Here's the end of the Lord of the Rings as Tolkien wrote it. The stars were shining in a clear, dark sky. It was the second day of the bright and cloudless spell that came every year to the Shire toward the end of March and was every year welcomed and praised as something surprising for the season. All the children were now in bed, and it was late, but here and there lights were still glimmering in the Shire and in the houses that dotted the night-folded countryside. Master Samwise stood at the door and looked away eastward. He drew Mistress Rosie to him, and he set his arm about her. March the 25th, he said, this day, 17 years ago, I didn't think I would ever see you again, but I kept hoping. I never hoped at all, Sam, she said. I didn't hope at all, not until that very day. And then, suddenly, I did. About noon, it was, and I felt so glad about it that I began singing. 
And my mother said, be quiet, lass. There's ruffians about. And I said, let them come. Their time will soon be over. Sam's coming back. And then you came. I did, said Sam. I came to the most belovedest place in the, all the world. I came back to my rose and to my garden. They went in, and Sam shut the door. But even as he did, he heard sudden, deep, and still the sigh and murmur of the sea on the shore of Middle-earth. <laughs>